Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Welcome back to our series on uh, women's writing. This particular lecture series, as you might have known by now, has been completely devoted to the field of women's writing, has taken into account the women authors who have been writing throughout the centuries, right from you know 500 years back till now, because before that we do not know what happened to the women, what kind of situation they were in. And five in 500 years from now, we also cannot predict what the situation of women authors will be. But there is something called speculative fiction. When you speculate, when you think what it can be and you try to formulate a picture of the distant future, we will be talking about those things in this particular lecture titled Dreaming of Emancipation, Women's Writing and Speculative Fiction. When we talk about emancipation, what do we think emancipation is? It is emancipation of thought, is it emancipation of physical action, physical action related to the decision, em emancipation of the self. What does emancipation mean? In layman's terms, it, mean, it means freedom, simple freedom, freedom of thought, freedom of maybe let us say expression, it can be anything is not it. So, there are multiple layers of women's experiences in this world. We are trying to bring all those experiences into discussion so that the variety can be at least understood. Otherwise, what the case is if you take up any novel, the women characters they are fit into a particular category. This is how women behave, that is how the male gaze, the male authors look at women characters. And also, talking about the other women writers. They also look at women from that very perspective because otherwise their books will not be acceptable to the society, they will not sell books, they will not be able to generate revenue. Everything goes back to the economy in our current social setup because it is a capitalist setup. Everything is about the capital, everything, capital meaning? What is the meaning of the word capital? An amount of money that you have stored for yourself that you are not going to spend, your savings, it becomes your capital, you invest it and your money grows. That kind of society we are in, we are not the investors, I am afraid we are just the invested, we are the ones, the working class people, we are the ones who are getting, drawing the salary and spending it, not able to make, build any kind of capital. But those people who are employing us, they are generating a lot of profit from us, they are keeping that money. Coming back to this, in this society, if there is an author, the author needs to sustain herself, needs to earn money, earn the bread, bread winning that we call, earn the bread for the family. If she is an author and she is writing books which are not acceptable to the society, do you think that she will be um, applauded? She can win some prizes, but she will never be able to fend for her, uh, you know, herself, her family. She will have to rely on charity. But what happens is that authors mostly tend to sell books written according to the mental setup of the society, thereby they generate the review, uh, revenue, they take the money home and they are happy. But there is, there is something called speculative fiction 
and this area of speculative fiction right at the outset declares that this particular work of fiction that I am going to write, this particular book I am going to write has nothing to do with the reality. This is a disclaimer that it gives right at the very outset, nothing to do with the reality. So, even if I am writing something crazy that might sound crazy to you, but I have said already it is nothing to do with the reality. So, in this kind of setup what a woman author can gain from this practice? How does speculative fiction allow the freedom that women authors must have in order to write about their experiences, right? So, this particular gap that originated in the form of speculative fiction, speculate speculate is a you know a word which means to think uh, ahead to anticipate to consider what may happen. So, may happen is you know the kind of uh, deciding factor for speculative fiction. What may happen in the future nobody knows, neither do you know, neither do I know, neither the people who are around me knows what kind of future are we stepping into. At least we are sure that it will be very much technically advanced, but the man woman relationship, the politics, the power relationship, the religious fanaticism that is going to spread, we do not know whether it is going to take roots or whether it is uh, going to get demolished whether patriarchy will be there or whether uh, there will arise a society of matriarchy, we know we do not know. So, not knowing the future is giving us an advantage as authors. We are now chiefly basing our hypothesis on that not knowing factor, because the audience does not know what the future is. So, they cannot say that you have written something which is unacceptable, because it is not related to life. You do not know what the life will be then. So, this particular spec, uh, you know area of speculative fiction gives women authors that kind of periphery, that kind of area, that kind of range to experiment with the thought processes, to experiment with the kind of uh, uh, let us say uh, societal structure, cultural, traditional beliefs, practices which otherwise would not have been acceptable to human beings under the patriarchal law, right. So, moving on to the domain speculative fiction, it is an umbrella term. When I was discussing nature versus culture debate in my previous lecture, and in some other lectures I have also discussed this particular thing called the umbrella term. What is an umbrella term? An umbrella term is like place which has a term which has many things inside it. Has for example, take if you have an umbrella, there can be more than one people in uh, underneath the umbrella. If it is a big umbrella, then you can have more than two people underneath the same umbrella. So, umbrella is a half dome shaped like you know hemispherical kind of empty hollow hemisphere, where you can put in you know many things. So, speculative fiction is like an umbrella term, which covers many things and inside it is an umbrella term for fiction, genres with elements that are imaginary. So, these elements that we are going to discuss all of these can come under that umbrella of speculative fiction. What are imaginary societies, historical timelines, natural objects, unreal settings come under this category. Settings, there is a something called nowhere land. Suppose somebody is telling you a story, there is a movie something, they are calling that place nowhere land because it does not exist in the real life. They can also create magical objects, I have given the example of these things, Harry Potter series, the Lord of the Rings series, Robot 2.0, all of these things have 
imaginary technologies, imaginary objects, imaginary beings. If you just go through the Lord of the Rings or the Harry Potter series, there are so many characters, elves, Gryffindors, this and that, that you will find that they are not there in our real life. But they exist in that society because these series, they have created a society where these things are normal. Also, you can take, for example, Sir Terry Pratchett's Discworld. It is a wonderful series of, I think, 42 novellas. You must go through that uh, series. Uh, it's a science fiction come um, fantasy novel. Wonderful uh, series. You can go and have a look at that. I have mentioned these names because these are very famous. But Discworld is not that famous, although it has given rise to many other kinds of literature. Right. So, fantasy is one of the chief elements of this speculative fiction. A very common, uh, nowadays it is very popular or it was popular a couple of years back, that is Game of Thrones. It is a web series where, you know, dragons are coming, they are laying eggs and, you know, uh, the territories are being swammed by different kinds of animals, imaginary beings. Then, uh, uh, you know, the uh, ice king, this and that, zombie kind of thing. Everything, these are very imaginative, these are the things that we are afraid of, we consider them, uh, well, these are the evil forces. So, whenever there is an inclusion of these fantastical creatures, you will have to consider them as fantasy. And as a part of the fantasy fiction, these, symb these uh, elements serve a symbolical purpose. They have a symbol. It is not evident. The dragon is not a symbol of destruction. The dragon is also a symbol for the power. Whoever owns the dragons have the, have the power. So, this kind of mental setup. Again, you take uh, small examples in the Harry Potter series, the most common fictitious object which is not related to the common life is the magical wand. Everybody has a wand. Does that mean that uh, wand is just a wand? It is a reminder to the audience all the time that whatever you are viewing currently is a fantastic uh, story. It does not have any um, relation to the uh, reality. But then this wand also symbolizes power. The stronger the wand you have, the more powerful the character you are in the story. So these things, whatever magical elements, fantastic elements you uh, incorporate in the story, everything serves a symbolical purpose. So all the speculative fiction at some level have inside them embedded a symbol. Everything is a symbol of something else because that is how we subconsciously connect to the text we are reading. Otherwise, there will be no point. Why will I be interested in reading, uh, uh, you know, two um, aliens falling in love with each other? We see those aliens as uh, human beings. We connect to them as human beings because they are showing emotions. And emotions are as tricky as it gets in the human experience. So that common underlying factor that those aliens become symbol for the human beings, we are very much attracted towards the story. So that is how speculative fiction works. It is a very nice, good, warm place for women writers to contradict, to go against the patriarchal law. They do not have to think what people are going to think because they are giving a disclaimer, this is a speculative fiction. So, fantastic beings, clones, a very important symbol in today's life, in today's um, science fiction movies, uh, series are clones. Clones are, you know, cloning is not um, permissible. A, no, no government uh, on this planet can give a clean or green signal to the process of cloning. Although human beings have the technology to clone other human beings, 
but how our is our society ready to accept the cloned human beings because we already know that they are not the real copy the real copy is somebody else they are just clones so there is a possibility that the, we are going to uh, enslave the clones we are going to make them as slaves that is why the governments deny any kind of experiment for cloning this is called as reproductive cloning there is another thing called therapeutic cloning therapeutic cloning is actually sanctioned by the government because there what happens suppose you lose an arm you cannot grow an arm like a lizard right we do not have human beings can only grow one uh, organ and that is liver if your liver is cut it will grow regrow that is the only human um, organ that we have which regrows itself but you cannot grow a hand so what they do uh, right now genetics or eugenics have been you know very active they are uh, uh, taking the stem cells of the baby right at the very birth they are freezing it the stem cells they have the property of uh, growing any organ we can program the cells like we program a computer we can program the cells to grow an organ that is very interesting it's called therapeutic cloning you can go and uh, read about it so it is not entirely fantastical it has some kind some kind of connection to the society we are living in but there is something called bioethics and the board that controls this bioethics in experiment they have said no no reproductive cloning you cannot reproduce a human being otherwise we have cloned till now 42 species starting with a sheep okay so let's get back human like robots imagine realities all of these things are part of the speculative fiction what has it done for the women authors let us have a look you can create a utopia or you can create a dystopia what are these two terms very interesting terms utopia this is of course merriam webster dictionary i trust it because it takes up the um, latest kind of definition instead of just going uh, you know by the trend utopia a place of ideal perfection especially in laws government and social conditions so utopia is actually a physical place it's a land it's a place where everything is perfect the relationship between man and woman is perfect the relationship between government and the ruled is perfect the relationship between private agencies and government agencies perfect the relationship between rules uh, that is the court of justice and the citizens perfect but that is not the reality right we have something called corruption that creates all sorts of problems because of corruption we cannot attain you know this utopia otherwise whatever rules and regulations are there in the country's constitutional document if everybody starts following them line to line there will be a utopia but corruption because human beings have the deadly scenes of greed lust telling lies becoming angry all those emotional imbalance that creates or leads to corruption you want admission you give me money i will give you admission to the hospital you don't have money okay no admission and this happened during the covid pandemic there were people who wanted to uh, access the icu people who wanted to access some oxygen cylinders no government uh, the health centers they said okay you give me 4 lakh rupees and these are some news which came out in the public there are you know hundreds of news which did not hit the main pages or were not communicated to the media okay so that is why we do not have a utopia we cannot have a utopia and moreover the social system that we are in forces us to lie forces us to cheat forces us to 
not help other people tells us oh if you help others you are wasting your own time and you know time is money if you are helping others you are wasting your time and money so if you think and you are a foolish if you are doing that so like i said right at the beginning of this lecture that if you are in a capitalistic society you are wasting time and money then you are foolish that is what happens what is a dystopia if our society is not a utopia is it a dystopia let's see an imagined world again dystopia is not a real world it's an imagined world or society in which people lead wretched dehumanized and fearful lives at least in our society we go out work earn money come back enjoy the money we have earned spend time with our family have our own decisions personal wishes whatever it may be but in a dystopia you are not allowed to make decisions for yourselves every time there will be a gun pointed to your head you can be killed at any moment you will completely surrender to the rule of the uh, ruler or the person ruling that dystopia you will have absolutely no rights we have right to freedom right to equality right to speech right to education no rights will be given to you whatever will be told you will have to follow that is like you know the slave kind of slavery kind of thing so dystopia was real for the african slaves who were uh, shipped to england or america for them they have lived the dystopian life but we thankfully uh, you are seeing this lecture now i am recording this lecture now we do not have that kind of life we are making decisions for ourselves so we are neither in an utopia nor in a dystopia we are somewhere in the middle charlotte perkins gilman she wrote a novel the name of the novel is her land now from the name you can guess that the land which is referred to here for example if you call this as england then iceland greenland all of these are after all countries societies everybody has this thing at the end so similarly her land that is a place where only women live that is why it is called a utopia it is a perfect society which charlotte perkins gilman talks about it's a novel it's a story about a few boys three boys who go into uh, an adventure trip to search for the uh, place called her land which they have heard in rumors people say that do you know there is a society like that nobody believes them but these three boys they said that okay let us have a look let us go and search if we can find that place so ultimately they do find that place but they are not very comfortable there because there are no men there has been a logical explanation uh, uh, the author has given a back story that something happened due to some natural disaster many people were killed uh, the men killed uh, the remaining men they want they killed the sons and the uh, old women and the men of the society wanted to take over but the women they fought back and they killed all the men so after that a woman in that remaining society she conceives a child through parthenogenesis i have written the word over here it's a difficult word but it is only a term for asexual reproduction which is you know it is not something which is scientifically proved it is still under consideration many people say that the entire religion of christianity is based on um the birth of jesus which ha- which was caused by parthenogenesis parthenogenesis means the woman will herself become pregnant without the interference of any male so the that woman is not uh, having uh, any sexual relationship with any male partners yet 
she is getting pregnant by her own self that process is called parthenogenesis it ha it is a medical term but it has no reality in reality we have not seen any cases till now so in this novel gilman says that the entire society has been created out of parthenogenesis women bear children without men these are the male characters of the novel van dyke jennings terry o nicholson and jeff margrave these three people these three men go into that society try to understand them try not to understand them try to argue with them try to run away do all sorts of things then something happens one thing leads to another they find some women whom they find attractive and there is uh, some marriage ritual and everything which the women of the society do not understand we will go through the story but just let us read a few excerpts from the novel to begin with see the first excerpt they were inconveniently reasonable these women see the position of the word inconveniently right before reasonable why do you think that this word has been used because the novel is mostly written from a male perspective why is the author a male no she is a female but the readers are from that kind of mental upbringing which definitely says that whatever uh, women do are unreasonable they do not have any kind of reason they just go and do it because they are emotional they are irrational these kind of things because that is the society that is the patriarchal society that is how women are looked at so this particular line uh, the boys the men they are observing the women in the in that society and they are uncon inconveniently reasonable because if they are reasonable we cannot condemn them as unreasonable we cannot condemn them as irrational we cannot argue with them so it is not very convenient to us it is not very comfortable to us because we are uh, from that male dominated society we are the men we are supposed to be reasonable but they are more reasonable than us the next excerpt we have over here we seem to think that if there were men we could fight them and if there were only women why they would be no obstacles at all jeff with his gentle romantic old fashioned notions of women as clinging vines terry with his clear decided practical theories that there were two kinds of women those he wanted and those he didn't desirable and undesirable was his demarcation the latter was a large class but negligible he had never thought about them at all so now it's very interesting here we seem to think that if there were men we could fight them and if there were only women why there would be no obstacles at all jeff with his gentle romantic old fashioned notions of women as clinging vines jeff is thinking that okay if there are women we have to fight with them all the time if there are men in the society we have to fight with them all the time but if there are only women we don't have to fight with them because they are sort of dependent on us they are like clinging vines which vines are you know a kind of climber uh, which uh, bears fruits like grapes and everything so they don't have a backbone that is what jeff is trying to say they don't have a backbone so they are always dependent on us that is the men we don't have to fight them we we he is a little bit of romantic in this case because he has gentle romantic he thinks that it's fine if there were men we had to fight with them but there are no men in the society so it's not a problem but the problem comes when terry's opinions are expressed with his clear decided practical theories it is very you know satirical at this moment that there were two kinds of women those he wanted and those he didn't now he wanted it is explicitly 
you know it is not Im, uh, an implicit suggestion it is explicit that it is related to the sexual appeal of women he wanted and those he didn't so some people some women they were attractive from the sexual point of view and some women who were not attractive from the sexual point of view that was the idea of terry about women so we can imagine what wretched society we are living in desirable and undesirable was his demarcation that is all two kinds of women desirable and undesirable and to add to that the latter as a large class but negligible so the latter that is the undesirable class of women most of the women are undesirable and therefore i am not thinking of them i am only going to think about the desirable the sexually attractive women so that is how these boys have become men that is how they have been brought up in the society and they have a sense of entitlement towards the desirable women he had never thought about them at all there is no place there is no existence of undesirable women in his life he thinks it is just a waste of time to think about it this is another excerpt from that very novel the care of babies involves education and is entrusted only to the most fit she repeated then you separate mother and child so in this particular excerpt we come to know that in her land a mother gives birth to a child and the child is taken and given entrusted to the care of another person this is unacceptable to the men they are horrified how can you separate a mother and a child that is bad because her land everything is women dominated why are you separating the mother and the child something of terry's feeling creeping over me that there must be something wrong among these many virtues these women they have so many good qualities but they are doing this completely wrong in our society we never separate women and the child that means your society is also flawed you are separating the child from the mother now see what happens not usually she patiently explained we don't do that usually you see almost every woman values her maternity above everything else almost every women they have this um, value system they think that when they are mothers that is the most important thing in their life each girl holds it close and dear an exquisite joy a crowning honor the most intimate most personal most precious thing that is the child rearing has come to be with us as a culture so profoundly studied so it is no more natural thing we have studied the act of child rearing how a child should be reared so that nothing of you know there is no harm done to it practiced with such subtlety and skill that the more we love our children the less we are willing to trust that process to unskilled hands the more we love our children the more we are afraid that because we do not have the practice of child rearing maybe maybe there is a there is 1% chance that we are doing it wrong even our own we forget at the moment that i am the mother i am going to take charge no we even doubt ourselves that let me take a second opinion those who have already done it done it in a better way let me consider an, uh, their opinion ask them that can you please help me rear my child like you did because i want to bring up my child in the perfect way that you have done so we do not boast ourselves as mother we consider it a kind of lesson to our life a, a kind of thing that we have to learn first then apply not being a mother does not make us mothers Ch giving a birth to a child does not make us mothers we have to learn 
how to be a mother, then we be a mother. But a mother's love, I ventured. She studied my face, trying to work out a means of clear explanation. You told us about your dentists, she said at length. So now this woman is trying to explain the man what happens really, because the man is not able to understand this. Those quaintly specialized persons who spend their lives filling little holes in other person's teeth, even in children's teeth sometimes. So those people who have spent their entire lives caring for others' teeth, don't you think that they will know more than you do about your teeth? So they have specialized in that discipline. Suppose you have a toothache, will you go to the mirror and just pull out the tooth? Of course you are not, you are going to the, go to visit a dentist because you know that that person knows more than I do about teeth. So that is the same kind of thing they have done with child rearing. That many people are specialized in that, they do it best. So instead of us trying to boast our maternity, trying to claim our status as mother, we very patiently learn to be mothers. Does mother love urge mothers with you to fill their own children's teeth or to wish to? Do you think when your child's tooth aches, the mother will come running, okay, let me do all the surgery on your teeth. That is not the mother, what the mother is going to do. The mother will take that child to a surgeon. Why? No, of course not, I protested. But that is a highly specialized craft. Surely the care of babies is open to any woman and mother. Now here the man is saying that no, that is a highly specialized craft, caring for the teeth. But child rearing, no, no, it's nothing, uh, you know, it's a natural thing. We do not think so. The women said no, child rearing is equally a specialized craft. Those of us who are the most highly competent fulfill that office and a majority of our girls eagerly try for it. I assure you, we have the very best. But the poor mother bereaved of her baby. But don't you think the mother will be sad that her baby is given to somebody else? Oh no, she earnestly assured me, not in the least bereaved. It is her baby still. It is with her. She has not lost it. But she is not the only one to care for it. We don't take away the baby. We just give to that family a person who knows how to take care of the baby. There are others whom she knows to be wiser. She knows it because she has studied as they did. So if you study, you know that there are other people who have studied more than you did. Only a person who has not studied, who is foolish will think that I know everything. But if you have studied properly, if you had had good, have had good education, you will know that there are other educated people out there who are more educated than you are. Practiced as they did and honors their real superiority. For the child's sake, she is glad to have for it this highest care. So these are the observations. You can have a look at them. Women, strong, athletic, self-confident, clearly intelligent, and obviously unafraid of men. Highest honor in the society is motherhood. Abortion, violence against women. Now they thought abortion is violence against women. This is something common to our society. But you will be very surprised to know this has nothing to do with what we think abortion is. We think we have to abort a baby because of the societal pressure. They don't have societal pressure. There is no need to abort a baby. If you have a baby, there are people who are ready to take care of it. So that is why in their society, if you abort a baby, then you are sick. But here, if you abort a baby, that means you are hiding. So these kind of mentalities are different. Men, women are naturally subordinate. Men think like this. 
Women wants to be mastered by men. Chivalry, gallantry, romantic. The men who had gone to her land, they have this kind of notions. This is something that happens in her land. Van is considerate and eager to learn about her, her land, also expresses his own views. Terry cannot come out of his comfort zone. Terry is the one who is very obstinate, very stubborn. He says, no, 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 women are, you know, subordinate, we should master them and this and that. He is not ready to accept the values of her land. Jeff is enamored. Now, Jeff is the character who falls in love with the entire setting, with the social life of her land and accepts its superiority. What happens, what, what kind of relationships they make, Van Dyke Jennings marries Ilador and their marriage turns into friendship. Terry O. Nicholson. Terry is that stubborn person. What happens to him? He marries a girl, very attractive girl and tries to rape that girl because that girl is not very much acquainted with male physical intimacy. So she says, no, no, we are not going to have this. They said, no, you are my wife and I own you, so you must submit to my will. So here Alima, she is not a woman who has been brought up in our patriarchal society that she will keep quiet. She goes and reports it and Terry is asked to leave the society. Jeff Margrave, he falls in love with Celis. Celis also falls in love with Jeff. Jeff stays behind in her land. Celis gets pregnant. They have a chill child together. There is a rumor of a real life Herland. In 2015, there was a Twitter post. A hacktivist Facebook group is crowdsourcing plans for a female utopia based on the novel Herland. This is a kind of newspaper article which came in the magazine Vocative. If you just go and have a look, you can see there are many YouTube videos where there are no videos, but there are audio conversations. Somebody asks, interviewing a person, the person is saying that, yes, we are raising the money to build a society like that, where all the women are welcome who are not a part of the society. They have been, uh, you know, uh, socially stigmatized. They have been victims of uh, uh, abuse. Now we are uh, 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 crowdsourcing. Crowdsourcing, that means they are raising money from everybody even if you give 10 rupees that is uh, you know their donation it goes to their donation so they have bought some lands i am telling you this is again a rumor we don't have any concrete evidence of this but it is in the news it is a kind of open secret that is going on right now and you can just go and look up for further details so the setting has been selected at the jungles of latin america that some people have bought la some land, they're setting up a society where only females are going to be there. And of course, they have accepted LGBTQ people also because they are also subjugated and dehumanized by the male or heterosexual society. This is another story, Sultana's Dream by Rokea Begum. This was published in 1905. It is a utopian story. Here, Sultana dreams about, Sultana is a woman who is in her 50s and she's dreaming about a society very much like her land. Her land is a novel. Sultana's dream, it's a short story written by Rokea Shekhawat Hussain. There, the same thing happens. You see the excerpt. Some of the passers-by, or the only thing is that her land has been set in some Western countries. This is set in India. Rokea Begum is an Indian author. Some of the passers-by made jokes at me. Though I could not understand their language, yet I felt sure they were joking. I asked my friend, what do they say? The women say that you look very mannish. Mannish? Said I. What do they mean by that? They mean that you are shy and timid like men. So this particular story has gone a step above. In that society, men are there, but men are the exact opposite of what in our society they are. In our society, they are bold and confident everywhere. That is how the society thinks. 
but in this society the men are very shy very timid they don't want to come outside they don't want to talk to anybody so this is again reversal of our societal system here is a you know brief uh, reading for you from that story as a matter of fact in your country this very thing is done men who do or at least are capable of doing no end of mischief are let loose and the innocent women shut up in the zenana in your country men are, who are actually creating problems they are roaming around in the society and the women they are shut up in the zenana zenana uh, you know it's a muslim culture zenana is uh, like the parda behind the parda they are shut how can you trust those untrained men out of doors you cannot trust the, these men out of doors because they have no you know social standing they are not reasonable they do all sorts of horrible things we have no hand or voice in the management of our social affairs this is what the author is saying in india man is lord and master he has taken to himself all powers and privileges and shut up the women in the zenana why do you allow yourselves to be shut up because it cannot be helped as they are stronger than women we cannot fight the men because they are stronger than us that is why we are shut then this woman makes a very good statement but it is not very concretely logical but tick but okay a lion is stronger than a man but it does not enable him to dominate the human race a lion is physically stronger than a man but does the lion dominate the human race no the lion is a lion it's a, you know it's in a cage right now because men have designed all sorts of things to control the power of the uh, lion so women if you are intelligent you are brilliant enough you will also find ways to control that kind of mischief that is going on to control the bad people in the society you have neglected the duty you owe to yourself and you have lost your natural rights by shutting your eyes to your own interests so these are the problems that she ventilates this is the last example that i'm going to give you today this is a dystopia it is not a utopia it's not a feminist utopia anymore this is a dystopia a horrifying tale a uh, a kind of society where women are treated as objects this has been written by margaret atwood she is a canadian novelist published in 1985 this is set in a very fictitious in a fictitious setting of republic of gilead which is somewhere in new england they are saying it is a futuristic novel it is strongly patriarchal that is the uh, government has been overpowered by these fanatics these christian fanatics totalitarian only one person is ruling everything theonomic that is the entire thing is revolving around the uh, you know christian ideals and uh, imposing that kind of mental um, uh, what should i say restrictions on people ruled by the divine law that is only the divine law will be followed only what god has said will be followed there will be no democracy this is the name of the character the female character of fred a handmaid a woman forcibly assigned to produce children for the commanders so the commanders are the highest ranking people the handmaids are women who are picked by the totalitarian uh, you know government they uh, pick the women from the common peop uh, lot of people they put these women with uh, the commanders and the commanders impregnate the women and their job is to raise the child just give birth to children the ruling class of men in gilead that is the commanders what is the status subjugated women in a patriarchal society loss of female agency and individuality you can not have a say anymore in the government or the state affairs you are a woman you are just a breeding machine you are just going to give birth to children that is your entire purpose of existence if you don't want to do that we will think of 
maybe if you are a sterile woman we will make you cook if you are sterile woman we can make you clean and do this and do that but no no education no sanitation no rights nothing suppression of women's reproductive rights you will not have reprodu uh, reproductive rights you will not have the right to your own body you cannot choose when to have a child and when not to have a child and there is another section where women also become a part of the resistance they call it the may day resistance what do we observe in that dystopian society social classes are created by men and women are at the bottom at the very end of the social class the commanders are at the top and the entirety of women population is at the bottom women become the lowest ranking class women are not allowed to own money or property in her land everybody had common property nobody was rich nobody was poor nothing it is kind of a shared property but here women are not allowed to have any kind of property you cannot even own your own vehicle women are not allowed to read and write no reading no writing nothing you just sit there and wait for your puberty once you are of the age 14 you will be given to a commander there you will have to breed his children own control over their reproductive functions they did not have any control over their reproductive functions and what is most interesting is the name of the characters of fred of glen these are the name of the handmaids the handmaids are you know that like i mentioned in the previous um, slide a woman forcibly assigned to produce children for the commanders they are the handmaids and their names are of fred of glen don't you see the pattern this is handmaid of fred so the person that woman has been assigned to this becomes the woman's name of glen that means handmaid of somebody called as glen their names have become a no more individual name their names have taken up the identity of the person i am of fred that is how they will introduce themselves to any person that is i am the handmaid of fred i am the handmaid of glen that is how their names have been designed so this is a dystopic society a dystopia unlike the utopia we have been discussing uh, so far in the utopian society you have all sorts of good things for women there is peace there is uh, a perfect balance between power and politics everything is under control but in dystopia women are treated like containers child containers their reproductive function becomes their purpose their other purpose if they are not capable of re uh, reproduction they are assigned some other tasks which are re most re related to the domestic uh, life of the generals of the commanders so from this this is a list of references you can have a look at and once you go through these you will have a clear idea why the concept of utopia and dystopia under the umbrella of speculative fiction is very important that is the space where women authors can express what might be what we can look out for that this this good things can happen this bad things can also happen so don't you think that when we are talking about this identity of fred of glen don't you think that is also a part of our reality now whenever we go out or uh, let's forget going out whenever you fill out a form you are asked to fill out a uh, wife of you are asked to fill out that category if you are a female ha, you are wife of daughter of so don't you write wife of this person 
wife of let us say x, y, z that becomes this same thing is taken up as your name. So consider that the same thing is taken up as your name daughter of x, y, z. What will happen when you will be introducing yourself as handmaid of x, y, z? So, of Fred, of Glenn, this is how the names have come. So, this is a very powerful novel, this is a very powerful text written by Margaret Atwood. It contemplates the entire society we are living in now, but in very direct and very gory, g o r y, gory means bloody, bloody terms. I hope that this lecture has given you insight into the possibility, the scope of women's writing consider it, the, um, considering the speculative domain. Once you have read these novels, you will have a clearer idea, you will be able to analyze our society, analyze the symbols more clearly. Thank you for being with us. I hope uh, we have discussed a lot today and you will take a lot from this lecture. See you in the next one. Thanks. Understanding oneself, understanding others, understanding society at large, understanding the nature, these are all driven by basic human curiosity. We would all love to understand why things happen, what happens, what is the final outcome, why certain things fail. Social sciences, that is the reason why humanities and social sciences should be understood by all of us. The knowledge that is segregated, that is divided with respect to areas, specializations, all of them needs to be understood in its context. And what provides the context? It is the social reality. How do you correlate knowledge in a given domain with the cultural reality, with the social reality, with the socio-political compulsions? Okay. How do you understand the law of nature? Okay, in its totality and for doing that you require the understanding of humanities and social sciences. Say for instance, if you are trying to understand the effect of a particular bacteria, a virus, any microbe, how it affects behavior, how it affects the organism, human being, you start looking at it from a pure biological point of view. If you are trying to look at a particular type of a wavelength, say for example, you are emphasizing on the understanding of the effect of radiation on human life. You are looking at things from a physical point of view. You are looking at the corresponding changes inside the body. You are looking at the physiological side of the uh, understanding of the information. You are trying to understand why despite knowing the risk that is inbuilt in the process, why still human beings engage into it. You are looking at it from a pure behavioral point of view why society at large admire things which has full of risk. You are trying to understand things from a pure sociological point of view. Why people use particular uh, set of words to explain those experiences. You are trying to understand things from the linguistic point of view. So, there are whole lot of things and then finally, you try to combine all of them to say that what are the guiding principles in life. Then you say you are looking at life, you are looking at humanity from a pure philosophical point of view. And this is what social sciences courses provide you. They provide the context to you in which you would be finally positioning the understanding of the knowledge in any given domain. It could be engineering, it could be sciences, it could be medical sciences, it could be social sciences stuff, it could be humanities stuff. So, con contextualizing the knowledge 
is what humanities social science courses help you obtain.